we're running about 10 minutes late, actually, and we have a Facebook Live transmission at 10.35. And having been in the broadcast business for so long, I know that we mustn't um, be late. Uh, Mel, if you could go to the... That's right. Um, what we want to summarize uh, is work that is really not just 24-7, it's 25-8. I left the, the broadcasting business three years ago thinking I'd have an easy life. Then Putin invaded Crimea. Then Ebola happened. Then... Uh, the Saudis reduced the oil price by 60%. It was 2014. Sorry, that's catching. Um, 2014. And other things have happened since, and I don't have to go into the detail. But over a flat white coffee, something was going on, we decided. So what we want to do over the next 25 minutes or so, and I'm going to give you a warning now. Uh, the comfort zone is left behind. I'm going to come to you about thinking the unthinkable. What unthinkables are on your mind? This time last year you weren't thinking about what would happen politically in this country in the way it did. We certainly in Europe and certainly us in Britain were never thinking that Brexit would happen. So what should be on your agenda? I'm gonna to come to you with microphones in four or five minutes. So you've had warning. And if none of you have got any ideas, you're in the wrong job. Right, so this is the first slide, and it really is a red alert. Remember what uh, Dave said a moment ago, we are not sure where we're heading. Um, there's a struggle on how to respond, and what we've been doing for the last three years is pulling together an enormous amount of data which we want to share the headlines uh, of, you, of it with, with you, because this is a turbocharged time where the way you've done things is not the way you're going to be doing things or should be doing things. So things are changing ama amazingly fast. And it's essentially, these, we believe, based on 3,500 pages of transcripts of interviews, are existential threats to both companies and governments. And that, it is that serious. And that's why this is a red alert. And this is not because I'm in the United States. But what has, what has been indicated by your president and the way that he's running his government, and the way the British government is running its government, and the Polish government, and the Hungarian government, is indicative that something has changed significantly. There is a new way, not just of doing business, but it is a way of challenging everything. There are those out there, and maybe some of you are among them, who think that this is just a blip. I would put to you that is a dangerous assumption to be making, a dangerous way of assuming that somehow things are going to return. The number of people we've spoken to at very high level are saying that they are scared, they feel vulnerable, even, um, even if there are moments when they feel they've got back control. It's about how much you're going to get ahead of what is happening uh, in this world at high speed. This is how it was summarized when in Chatham House, which is the Royal Inter International Institute for International Affairs, in June of last year, they asked us to pull together before their London conference at the beginning of June, all our findings, and that's exactly what we did. And they came up with this great cartoon, those in dark suits, blindfolded, uncertain of what was going on, and those men and women who are really deeply concerned about where things were going. It's a great cartoon and it really is emblematic because of the blindfolds. And there are two summary takeaways from our findings at this moment. The conformity which gets people to the top is now in many ways disqualifying them from understanding the enormity of change. Because by qualifying for the top with that level of conformity, that in many ways means you've got the blinders on. You can't see what is coming left field, right field behind you and the speed at which it's coming. That long list we got from Dave of the activism that is now happening. That is challenging conformity. And that's why people like you, if I may say, need to feel uncomfortable or probably are feeling uncomfortable. But do you really want to talk about it, even on the record here? That I would put to you is a major challenge. And the second thing is just to be clear. It's about the human capacity to handle this. That's all we're looking at. This is about getting data, data to make sure that what we were saying was what we, um, what we were finding. And it was backed by evidence. Many did not believe that we were, what we were discovering was the case, particularly the Chartered Institute of Management Accountants, who kindly published our first edition. They said, we don't believe. But then the data convinced them. Chris, the data. Well, we've. You've been using little tape recorders to interview senior leaders from the C-suite 
uh, from the public sector and also from international NGOs. My background, I've been an activist in peace building, and Nick roped me in to really do a process of trying to understand from 2015 onwards why leaders were so struggling. And that's been at the heart of our work. It's looking at issues to do with culture, mindset, and, be and behavior, and the systems and incentives that, that entrench them. So this is about activism, and I'd put to you that part of the problem that there's been based on populism, nationalism, and the rejection of globalization is not just about those issues. It's actually, and this is what we uncovered in the last three years, it's actually about the inability of leaders, both in the political sector and also in the corporate sector, to understand the enormity of, of what was going on and how out of touch they had become. Therefore, the activism side of this, and that's why I'm delighted to be here, we're delighted to be here, is because it actually reflects those you are working with, those who are working for you, and above all, those who are above you too. How much are they in touch with the reality that the kind of list that we got from Dave is actually challenging every single assumption that you have to make about the way things are going? And we can talk about Trump. We can talk about, um, we can talk about Brexit. We can talk about the existential threat to the European Union. But I would put to you the scale of this now is moving so fast with artificial intelligence, with algorithms, with the effect of, on jobs, not just the truckers here in the United States, but so many jobs that so many jobs are going to be affected, that this is going to become a major political challenge of how to manage it. Do we have to say to the population, we can keep things as they are, but we can no longer guarantee the way things are going? Because essentially, if you've got large numbers of people, maybe even around here, who are no longer working uh, in back office jobs and they're replaced by algorithms, that's a mortgage, it's prosperity, which means the potential for a hollowing out of the middle class. So in many ways, what I'm, we're putting on the agenda for you today is something that isn't going to happen in 20 years. It's probably going to happen in 20 months or even 20 weeks or 20 days. It's that speedy. Let's pause for the moment. Let's get the microphones. Who's thinking unthinkables? And um, what is on your mind at the moment? I can't see you all, but what kind of things should you be putting? Please, go ahead. And please introduce yourself. Let's, let's move it very quickly. What's your do, uh, no, I just want to know what you're thinking of. Um, Brexit. What about Brexit? It's happening. Well, I would like to know if Scotland will leave the EU and the uh, United Kingdom. I can't answer that question, but it's moving a bit closer to that. It, it'll be a disunited kingdom, potentially, yes. But it's not an unthinkable. It's being thought about. So think even further than that, please. Please, thank you. Severe disruptions, including potentially civil war in the United States. Well, right. Um, Mel, <laughs> Mel, could you possibly put up the uh, Apple TV, please, so I can just write that down? Civil war in the United States. All right. Please. Please. So, so I had two. It's Perry Yateman. Um, one last night I was thinking that maybe Unilever, after the Kraft Heinz thing, was going to have to... Um, sell the food business, and then actually break up the management structure. Of course, I saw that actually happen this morning, so I don't know whether that's going to be um, unthinkable, but I'm actually spending a lot of time worrying about uh, nuclear war, to be honest. Where? Um, well, I think obviously the, the North Korea, you know, North Asia is certainly part of it, but um, I think it could happen in many different places. Is that an unthinkable, or is it now almost becoming inevitable? In other words, we have to keep thinking even beyond those things which appear more possible. Okay, well, as a mom, I have to say I'm still hoping it's the unthinkable, but uh, I take your point. I, is what you're saying about craft and, and, and so on, is that, uh, or Unilever, is that indicative of an unthinkable which has happened in 20 hours then? You thought about it, then it happened. Get the microphone, again, please. Three, sorry. Within a couple of weeks of the Kraft Heinz um, proposition, they are now actually actively putting on the table. Paul Pullman announced they are looking at the structure. And that has been a discussion that we've had for 70 years, and it was always considered untouchable. Okay, if I can fine. just make a point about Paul Pullman, who I was with last Thursday, his view is because of the focus on values and purpose, it was one reason why they were able to withstand the Kraft overtures. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, Tony Beck. Um, my unthinkable is that we're so focused on data that we actually miss the fact that it's about gut and emotion and instinct. 
Thank you. Thank you. Fascinating. Anyone else? Yes, on, on, your, on our right, please. Uh, global supply chains breaking down completely. Why would that happen? Uh, isolationism, that's uh, trade barriers, um, trade wars, all kinds of things that really disrupt those industries that rely on reliable, global, efficient global supply chains. Do you think that's being thought about at the moment? Not at the level it could um, really come to pass. Cyber intervention as well? Potentially. Supply chains breaking down. OK, who else, please? Thank you. Please, over here. Uh, Paul Argenti, Tech School. I'm worried we're teaching the wrong things at business school. We're not preparing people for this world at all. So so what, what would be your recommendation? Uh, blow up the curriculum at all the business schools. <laughs> That's stop. why I wanted you to say it. Um, stop, stop teaching things that are tangible and focus more on the intangible things. Okay. Thank Please, you. anyone else? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Hi. Hi, John Tseng. I would yeah. say uh, total breakdown in uh, air and domestic uh, and global air travel due to uh, miniaturization of explosives by the bad guys. Thank okay. you. Anyone else? Yeah. So over here, oh, please. Uh, Carol Cohn, um, Gen Z and millennials won't work for large companies. Anyone else? Yes, yeah, so over, over here, please. Uh, maybe a grand global, bar um, grand global bargain on debt forgiveness. Okay. Thank you. And then over here, please. Yeah, hi. And the, the microphone uh, here. The proposed anti-Muslim ban and its impact on the best and brightest from the Middle East coming to the United States and its impact on education and our global competitiveness. Let's take two more and then move on. Okay, uh, anyone else? We have one here, yes, for sure. Sure. Uh, the assumptions that we've made about our food chain completely disappear because of our environmental impact. So the food we're eating today has certain nutrients in it that may not be there tomorrow. Thank you. One more. Over here, would you? Oh, no, this, you've got a... You, you've got a microphone, yeah? Yeah, um, Bjorn Adler. Hi, Nick. Hi, Chris. Hi, Bjorn. Nice to see you again, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I can see you now. Yes. I, the deal breaking down, the deal between employees and employers, and you know, so the economic force is kind of blowing up, and, and this, this, this world of, of sort of liberal democracy founded on economic uh, forces working together, that kind of just you know, blows out the window. Thank you. This is not exclusive, but it gives you a taste of the kind of thi thing. That, let's just pause for the moment, if we can, because otherwise we're running a little late. So uh, maybe we can come back to that if we've got time. But what you've done there is really generated um, a, an awareness of a number of things which we have identified as well, particularly millennials won't go into companies. Um, that's one of the reasons why potentially there's an existential threat. Um, and also employer worker deals breaking down. This is what we meant by how much of this is really now being factored in to the thinking at board level, thinking at, uh, at government level. Because when you're trying to manage the immediate problem, these kind of meta massive issues are being sidelined, even though they're coming down the track at amazingly high speed. So these are the kind of things, debt forgiveness, food chains. Let me tell you, the German government issued a report last, week, last year warning every German they've got to have enough water and food for 10 days, fearful of what you, one of you called a nuclear threat. Now, are we dreaming here? Are we having nightmares? Probably. But these are real unthinkables. And based on our work in the last three, three years, we would say that this is a very serious existential challenge, the kind which we've been asked to, to come and talk about. And when you have someone like Ian Conn, the CEO of Centrica, saying at a Brussels forum in, uh, two weeks ago, the leadership challenge is huge. We have not got leadership because we are not up to the task. This, I guess, is why we've come here to rattle the cage, to make you feel uncomfortable, to leave the comfort zone behind, really to ask to, 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 to stir your concerns about how much you are prepared for all of this. 
So as we move on, there is that question then, thinking about the unthinkable and thinking about it and preparing for it smartly. How smart can you be in line with the kind of things that Dave was saying because of the trend we've seen now, Brexit, Trump, migration and Russia, and the critical issue of why leaders really have lost the plot on multiple issues. How much can you get ahead of this? How much can you prepare? And to pick up on those two points, Chris, purpose and also values, just re-emphasizing what you were ma making a point about a moment ago. And they're embodied in, obviously, the page model and the page, the page principles. And indeed, there's more and more research now that companies focused on values do actually achieve more value. And that's work that's been done by the London Business School, now, I think, later this month by, by Ernst & Young and also by uh, Deloitte. This is, I think, a really important point. So purpose and values, but notice the S underlined, yep. values, social responsibility, because that point being brought up about will millennials work for, for, want to work for companies and in government in future, I think there's a big question mark about that. Indeed, we've had a couple of brainstormings here in the United States, and when we did something similar to this at the Grand Hyatt back just before the election here, a number of those in their late 20s, early 30s came up to us at the Be Bold conference and said, I've just left my job inside a major corporate. I couldn't stand it any longer. And that's what we're beginning to see. I'm not saying, I'm not predicting it's going to happen, but we are seeing very clear clear evidence that that's the way things are moving, however you believe in the sanctity of the corporate structure. So we're talking about thinking the unthinkable and preparing for it smartly. And uh, this is proof that we have published a detailed document, and this is our peer-reviewed document, a new imperative for leadership in the digital age. And the reminder there of the blinders which are on at the moment in so many areas. But Chris, the three important issues that are emerging here on what has to be challenged, which doesn't cost money, but does require a different approach. We are very much focusing all our work on the human capacity to lead, to comprehend the extraordinary radical uh, uncertainty we're among. It, it's, a, it's about culture, behavior and mindset. And there are now fantastic tools with neuroscience and behavioral psychology to try and understand what the pressures are and how they can be withstood. And I was talking to somebody who was in the administration as a CTO of a major institution who said it's not rocket science to comprehend the issues, but obviously it's extremely difficult to change the culture, behavior, and, and mindset in organizations. And I was inspired by what I heard yesterday from Dick about the Arthur Page principles. There are ways to do it. They're quite old principles, as those are, but that's important. There are things we can do. It is very difficult to achieve them, but there are, there are clear ways, we, ways forward, which is why we're so excited to be here to engage with you all. But we would suggest to you it's not about a rewiring diagram of your management system. It's not about procurement of incredibly expensive bits of equipment to try and get over this problem. It's how you reconfigure the human software. And that's what we're beginning to see. We're beginning to test with a number of case studies. We can't, under NDAs, reveal them here, particularly on the record. But we are seeing moves forward in that area, which do give us signs that there are options to be considered, not necessarily solutions. But there's one critical issue here. It's easy to requote Herman Kahn and say, thinking the unthinkable. It has a kind of symmetric attraction there. But the real phrase which we'd like you to take away is thinking the unpalatable. Much of what has happened in the last three years, um, like much of history, there was plenty of evidence of what was going to happen, but somehow it didn't get into the boardroom. Somehow it wasn't being considered around the cabinet table, and we're going to come on to the reasons for that. Why was it that um, Putin had warned of what he was going to do in, in Crimea? Um, World Health Organization just didn't want to know about Ebola in West Africa, in which 11,000 people eventually died. They rejected Médecins Sans Frontières. Why did the Saudis do what they did, reducing the oil price by 60%, which they're now paying for, costing about 100 billion a year in sovereign wealth? And above all, where did ISIS come from? ISIS had been known about, but it didn't fit the narrative. The, Im the, the unpalatable, so often, is not actively being considered. And that's where we'd like to move it forward and talk to you about the scale of the challenge. The scale of the challenge probably in all your organizations, summarized brilliantly by Chris Donnelly from the Institute for Statecraft. And there are two phrases in here for you to take away. 
First of all, the rate of change we're going through at the moment is comparable to what happens in wartime. Wartime. Yet we think we're at peace. The global pace of change is overcoming the capacity of national and international institutions. Overcoming the capacity of national and international institutions. Which is why we come on to a terrible word which doesn't exist. <laughs> Deresponsibilization. It's probably happening in all your companies, and many of you are laughing. Laughing because I suspect you recognize where that comes from and what it indicates. Chris. Well, we first heard it from the then head of the British Foreign Office, Sir Simon Fraser, who we quote in our article, says, I don't even have time to think the thinkable, let alone the unthinkable. And it's this sense within organizations, and we've certainly uncovered a lot of it in the British Civil Service, and we've talked to people who are currently serving in the administration with huge dilemmas. But one director general in a British major department said, if I tell the minister this, I get my legs cut off. So responsibility is taken away. People feel uh, avert, risk averse. And, that, uh, and they, the responsibilities are no longer uh, 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 given to them. And that, that extraordinary sense of organizations going within themselves is, is at the heart of what we're looking at. Other phrases which have been quoted to us in behind uh, closed doors brainstorming, executive myopia, permafrost as well the permafrost within systems, where everyone is palming off responsibility, even if they do have responsibility for what is happening. Deresponsibilization, that human factor again, and particularly with the kind of language you get from certain governments about what should be done within the foreign, within, say, say, their services. There is now almost a degree of professional harassment. Certainly that is happening inside the British government, according to insiders. If you're not with us, you're against us, and that's a career problem. So let's move on, Chris, to the, um, the, the, the main points of our findings, all of which you'll say, so what? But I hope you'll recognize everything, and it's probably happening in an office where you're working or, or in a major institution where you're working. Then these are not new, but they came up time and time in all of our interviews. There are nine key points. The first one is being overwhelmed by multiple intense pressures. Institutional conformity. Conformity comes up in so many of our discussions. Willful blindness, again, from the get-go, this was an issue that was raised by so many of our interviewees. And we've interviewed not just CEO level people, but also a lot of millennials as well. And a link to that, of course, is groupthink. And the sense that organizations have, have, have lost the plot. They're risk averse. It's just, it's too dangerous to take really forthright decisions. We've heard time and again. And this is a phrase we heard, first of all, from the British military, and I think it's in the American military, and now it's become very common in, in the UK. CLMs, the, if I say that to the boss, I'm, I'm risking making a career limiting move. And this is a summary of what we heard from many criticisms, particularly among millennials, of reactionary mindset within their organizations. And linked to our first point, cognitive overload, just the sheer overload of information and sources coming in and the inability to cope and cognitive dissonance. And therefore, denial of things that should have been known about. What, what we've called, borrowing from the uh, environmentalist Adam Swadon, we've used the term black elephants. The elephants in the room, but like linked to the black swans, and people just don't want to talk about. So those are the main takeaways. We could have put them up 30 years ago. And many business analysts will say that it uh, could have been put up 30 years ago, or 20 years ago, even 40 years ago. The trouble is in the digital community with the kind of activism that Dave has summarized so, so well. This has now become a profound existential challenge and probably threat because the, if, these are not, uh, if these are not somehow resolved or addressed, then the kind of things already on your agendas are going to become even worse. That should be your working assumption. So what? Many of you are probably saying that on the, uh, the beginning of your conference here. What happens next? And what about solutions? We don't come with any great solutions for you. We've heard options which are being considered in some companies and organizations which are prepared to accept at least that there's a problem to address. But it's easy to say there must be, if there's a problem, there's a solution. Easy to say in a one business school said, so what's the solutions? We're saying time and time again, we're hearing, we understand the issue, but can't really address it 
because we can't get buy-in either at the board level or we can't get traction within the company. Um, even the German foreign ministry, who we'd been doing some work for, um, a senior figure there said to me, only last week we've been trying and trying, but we've had too much obstruction because those inside want to, pr to protect their own interests. Yet this is one government which up until a year ago accepted it hadn't quite understood that migration and the Russian threat were really what they called an end to tranquility. Changing the culture at the speed of the events that are taking place is really incredibly difficult. And it's also in the business schools, and the person who said the business schools should, uh, uh, should, um, uh, should be addressing this. I can tell you, having talked to a couple of business schools, this is not in the literature. And several people came up to me and said, we're not being taught that stuff here, but we should. So you make, a, again, a very good point. Uh, but with that, I may say to Nick, we're some honorable exceptions. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, what are the kind of key words to take away? Courage humility, and a safe space. And what about the language you use internally? No price, but a high cost. Wacky, we've seen people written off as wacky. Why aren't they being described as wise, particularly the next generation, the millennials who are being alienated? That's a stupid idea. Actually, it could be a sage idea which needs to be addressed. And above all, Maverick, one company we've been doing some work for said, the chief executive said, I've got no mavericks left in the company because we've crushed them. I want to shake the tree so that we find where this new talent is. And I had to say to him, if you shake the tree, all the fruit is likely to fall off. So these are very critical issues by our judgment. A maverick should be seen as a visionary. And we're seeing particular uh, attraction in a number of other areas which, which could offer hope a DARE unit inside where it's actually professionally advantageous to be a member of, or a foresight department. Indeed, there are a number of organizations reusing scenario planning and other ways to look at the ways of looking at different alternative futures. What are the what ifs? Of, what, would, what are the factors that could destroy their organization to really turn the questions upside down? And in a few organizations, they're borrowing red teaming from the military. The, that was the time of the Cold War, the idea that you would try and get in the uh, heads of the, the, the Soviet Union, the Reds. But we're warned by one of the best authors, who's a New York based um, author at the Council on Foreign Relations. Mika Zemko, that cultural barriers make really good red teaming very difficult to achieve. And finally, uh, on this, other things which some of you may be experimenting on, reverse mentoring, and a terrible word, rather like de-responsabilization used by a chief executive at a gathering like this, we're trying to youthize <laughs> our corporation. It was in the banking business. I said, youthize? <laughs> The chief executive said, yes. So let me bring it so Marjorie can come up and we yeah, can please, start having a, 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 a discussion uh, of where we think things are going. Um, we would not have been saying this uh, even a few weeks ago, but we see a significant change taking place, which allows activism to see a way forward, particularly leadership activism, dare I say, of a group like this joining together for the leadership challenge. And dare I say, imagine each one of these tables is a lily pad, because what we see is a lot of vulnerable, scared people out there. And we see the potential now, and it may seem too idealistic to you at the moment, a way of coming together um, where the sharing of experience, like at a conference like this, can be extraordinarily productive and constructive. And so finding a way to find a community and a process of interest, common interest, that surely is what activism can be about from your side as well. And take it even further, there could be an even bigger lily pad which brings a common understanding, a common agreement that this is a very serious issue. Because what we can see is that lily pad bringing together a significant amount of data and, and the challenges that we've been putting to you today. The data and challenges which can be shared in a way which is even with com competition and the need for having a competitive edge can be to your advantage because it's systemic as opposed to something to do with your product. And what we're doing at the moment is bringing together data from a large number of corporates, a large number of chief executives and chairmen so that they can share with the, their peers in a comfort zone what they are concerned about, how vulnerable they feel, and how scared they feel as well. So that's where we are. We are only giving you work in progress. 
maybe if we're invited back into the non-comfort zone again, Marjorie, <laughs> we'll be able to say in a year's time, there's amazing chair, there's amazing uh, improvement. Let me just end with one thing, even though I'm on the record. Sometimes it's a bit like having a whole load of alcoholics in the room. They don't want to talk about their problems, but suddenly after about an hour, they all realize they've got the same problem, and suddenly they're talking. It's amazing, but behind closed doors. Marjorie. Okay, well, thank you both. But we're going to um, just pause because um, one of the things that I thought would be valuable is to have the rest of this be interactive with you. And this is um, a bridge bas basically to having some understanding and context for the whole discussion we're about to have on activism because each one of these problems has associated with it a whole bunch of stakeholders. And um, if we don't understand the root causes, it's hard to, to pinpoint where the... Uh, Got, where the incoming missiles are going to come from or what we should do proactively to get ahead of them. So I wanted to, um, you know, take questions from the audience. And if you don't have some, I'll, th I'll throw some out. But I can't imagine this group not uh, being somewhat provoked by this. But while they're putting their hands up, um, Nick, can you tell us of all the things you've done? You've talked to, what, a few hundred CEOs? Yes. So what, what is the most inspiring? Leader, lead, not just CEOs, but leaders, 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 yeah. So what is the most inspiring thing you heard? We've, because we're now sitting in this place where it's, oh my God, you know. So what, what, is, what is the most inspiring thing you heard? That there are, and Paul Poorman has gone on the record about this, not because of Kraft, but he um, has talked about this uh, a lot. He is inspiring people, but also to the point where um, there are those who think he's maybe trying to go too fast. Uh, but there are others, and I've got to be careful here because I've, we've had so many confidential conversations. There are now some chief executives who have confided to us, to use that word again, that it's existential, and are prepared to say, we want to do this for the sake of the survival of our company, even, frankly, if we're not paid for it, because there's an intellectual challenge here. And that's what we're seeing among quite a few people now, that they see this as a, an attraction uh, because it's such... It's such a challenge, as opposed to worrying about what the board and the shareholders are going to say. But convincing high net worth individuals and shareholders remains a significant impediment to all of this, which is why education of boards and shareholders is going to be critical in all of this too. And one thing that uh, we found, even where there's a will, there isn't always a way. And a lot of the CEOs that Nick and Chris have talked to go back and they're, or the leaders, I don't want to say just CEOs, they're inspired to try to think a little differently. Uh, but there's the whole next level and the level below that where you don't always have the people organized to be supportive and to, uh, to help make change happen and change culturally is very difficult, as you all know, in big organizations. So we are all at the kind of the, I think, of CCOs as being at that point that either can help make things happen or not because uh, we're so embedded in the culture of these organizations. So let's take some questions and maybe there are some uh, answers in the audience and maybe there are other thoughts. And Marjorie, could I, yeah. could I encourage comments and if, if necessary disagreements? Comments, yes. yes. They love pushback too. We argue all the time. We don't yes. claim a monopoly of wisdom by any stretch of the imagination. Hi, Shannon Bowen. Um, I study ethics and issues management. So can you define red teaming and how that's different from scenario building, if it is? And then also, I'm interested in the values component that you showed. How do you get organizations to understand that they need to place importance on ethics and values when usually they're focused on the bottom line and survival? Chris. Well, um, let's do scenario planning. I mean, it was in, first invented by Shell, and the idea is you would look at a series of potential futures, uh, go a good future, a really bad future, a possible middle way, and try and work through how you achieve the, the desirable future of the ones that you've chosen and work back backwards. Other organisations, we heard from a Dutch organisation who do it in a radical way, that is they try and understand what could destroy the company. And just think, what are those, uh, okay, and do those factors we've invented, so to speak, do they exist in the real world as a way of looking at this disruption? Now, as I say, red teaming was devised by, uh, in the uh, period of the Cold War in, in the 60s with the idea that you would try and see in the mind of others. That's essentially what it's about. It's used by some companies. It's certainly used within the intelligence community. It still is. And then we're discovering in the world of developing software um, and also in terms of cybersecurity, you often have white hat, white hat hackers who try and get into the organization with their permission to see where, where the gaps are. And your question was on values. Is that right? Yeah. How do you get the organization to understand that ethics is key in 
as far as survival goes, how do you inculcate ethics as opposed to simply looking at the bottom line? Well, I think, to be honest, we, uh, there are many around this room who are better able to answer I, I that question. I was just going to say, given, I was going to throw that back yeah, to the exactly, group because exactly. I think that there are certainly organizations here that have spent a lot of time trying to embed ethics. Does anybody want to uh, jump in, General Mills? It, so. in the Microphone. Anyone else? A left or a right decision, and it helps speed that decision. There's someone over here that has a, a comment on that. And let's get, if there are one or two more, let's get them quickly and go on from there. Is there any, there's one over there, and I, I, it's hard to see up here, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, uh, in a world of uh, cultural dogma, uh, is our, our values really the solution uh, when those values may not be shared? Uh, across um, various publics, um, how can you be sure as an organization, as a leader, that the values that you espouse are the values that uh, will survive when even basic facts are in question? I think it's about experimentation. I think the point we're making, and it's not up on the board at the moment, but I put it up here, values is that the next generation, whether you want to call them millennials, generation Y or whatever, are seeing things in a very different way. One very senior a corporate chief executive said, we're now in danger of creating angry consumers and angry citizens who could destroy our value very quickly if we don't accept that this is an issue. Now, I'm gonna tell you something which is on the record because it's in the public space. I've just spent a couple of trips down to Nairobi where Safaricom, which is the kind of Verizon of uh, East Africa, um, it's the big telco provider. This time last year, they were cruising fine. Everything was good on, on revenue and so on. And then suddenly, a large number of the next generation, the millennials, got it into their head that they were being screwed on data packages. They were saying to the chief executive, you're a thief. And I'm not exaggerating those words. You're a thief. You're stealing our money. We don't have a lot of money. And half the country is under 25. Safaricom has been shaken. And they've confirmed it um, behind closed doors, but it's all in all, all the papers as well. They've been shaken because this time last year, they were believed they were untouchable and suddenly their revenue streams were falling because they were out of touch with their next customers, the under 25s who said, you're stealing our money. We don't care if you've got to invest in 4G. And so they've gone through a massive process in the, I'm summarizing very crudely here, but they've gone through a massive process in the last eight months of trying to survive um, to attract themselves to the next generation who they'd alienated and allowed to call them thieves. Now, that's about values, it's about the value for the next generation about a company which invented M-Pesa no longer serving them at a price that people can afford when a million kids don't have jobs. Now, I'm summarizing in a rather crude way, but that's what I mean by values, about how much you're, outs you're outside the very narrow zone of the quarterly returns and thinking the value is about how we survive and how we ensure survival. And look what's happened over hate videos and so on to, to YouTube and uh, other companies, even one large um, consumer company in the last 24 hours. So I think we should uh, take some more questions. But this question of values and value, I think uh, we would all say if you don't link these things to uh, the way they increase value, they're not sustainable. But there's a whole case to be made between the link between value and values. And maybe that's the subject of another conference because there's a lot to be said about that. And we have other people with questions, so I'm gonna move on. Uh, why don't we go over here? Hi, uh, Michael Mislansky. So, you know, as you set up this, uh, these issues, it seems to me that, that you set it up as uh, changing behaviors of individuals in response to new sets of pressures that maybe have not been there before. And I think I, I would push back a little bit and say, as I look at this, uh, and you talked about the lost art of leadership, you know, I believe humans are human. We, we respond to incentives a certain way. Behavioral science is increasingly showing that uh, we are, you know, whether it's predictably irrational or that we behave to stimuli in a certain way, even though it's not rational. And that what we've got here is a situation where human beings inside organizations, leaders inside organizations, are responding to the incentives before them, as they always have in the past, and as they always will in the future to a large extent. So I guess my, my question is, is do you really think that the art of leadership is lost 
or is it that we've never had it before, that we never really needed the kind of leadership uh, um, that we need today? And that really what we're asking for, or what, what you're looking for in terms of solutions is in some ways asking people to, um, to fight against the normal human uh, desire to respond to the incentives in front of them. Uh, it just seems like it's a very big ask if it's posed in a, in a different way, as opposed you, to saying somehow we're going to find these leaders that were lost along the way. Very quickly, you're making it sound like campaigners. All we're doing is providing you with evidence. There are, there are threats in so many areas. The German government has almost been brought down by migration. That was warned about for two years. What happened with Putin, that was known about, but NATO didn't seem to know about it or think it was, it was possible. What we're saying is that there are, if you're talking about the threats now to social stability, and there was that comment there about what I think you called about civil war. Others have talked about the potential for anarchy. We're not there yet. We're simply saying there is evidence of why these kind of things are not being put on the agenda at the highest level. We're not making that judgment at all. So don't see us as a, starting a campaign or something. That's not it. Sorry, I didn't suggest that, but in your list of, of nine behaviors mm -hmm. that are there, Chris. It, it suggests that there is a change in the way people are behaving today from the way that they've behaved in the past. And, and I would say that the lens through which we look at their behavior may be different, but those behaviors have been around for forever. You're right. History shows that. Yes, I think we often say that these are not new. You could have said them 30 years ago. Just to give you a, a domestic case study that we're exploring at the moment, there were a lot of innovations in the last four years in health and human services. For them, it was about changing the culture through incentives, and that was led by the then uh, secretary. And they, had, they brought in a whole series of people in, who they called chief technology officers, who was, whose job was to think through how they could create opportunities for staff members to come up with exciting and innovative approaches in an organization that was pretty stuck. And there are some extremely interesting things there, Ignite program and their prize program, and it's about changing the, the, the uh, incentive structure and empowering some of the younger staff, and that has, as I understand it, been very successful. We're exploring that case study at the moment. It can be done. The person we were talking to says it's not rocket science. It's known about. It's in the books going back many years. It's, it's, but the implementation requires real clear direction from the top. He told us the story when he was working with another boss. The boss got all the board members together and says, if you you, if this guy, my informant, rings you, he's speaking as if he's me. Listen to him. And so every I, I think we're going to take an, another question here. I think, though, that the point they were making is that even if everything was the same, the environment isn't the same. Yeah. And I think that's the point of the whole activism discussion, is that the world has changed. We can't look at it the same way we did before. And that is the, the problem with the kind of the question of conformity that has developed around the way we were kind of um, immunized or, um, you know, to, to the way we've done things before. And it's how do you change that? Yes. Hi, Tom Mattia. Um, oh, Tom. Hi, hey, how are you doing? <laughs> You're still alive. Um, <laughs> my, my, my thought is we seem to be talking about a lot of first culture things when the challenge comes from third culture places. And so my question to the two of you is, as you talk to leaders and talk to CEOs, how many of them are in structures that gets them out of their office and out on the street? I mean, how many have, so in my years at Coca-Cola, not saying that that's the absolute paragon, but we all had to get on the street. We all had to see where the product was sold and who was buying it and what the relationship was. That gives you a feel for what's happening around you. Do you see that or not see that in, in leadership today? Tom, it's a very, a very short answer. We don't have the data on that at all. I mean, whether people are getting out or whatever. Many of them t are too overwhelmed to get out anyway, and that's implicit in what they're telling us. But uh, I think it's a very important question. We do not have data on that. Um, I'm sorry. Let's go over here. Nicho Spring with Weber Sandwick. I'm wondering in your interviews whether you found any sense among these leaders that they need to lead not only their companies, but you know the sector. So if we think that government is totally overwhelmed by the complexity of our problems, is there any sense among these leaders that they need to actually coalesce, in, whether it's by industry to solve the problems of healthcare, or whether it's uh, that, that it needs to be, be, that their responsibility goes beyond 
um, their companies, and you know, the private sector is more agile in innovation and solutions than the public sector ever will be. So do you, did you get a sense of that? I would, I mentioned that when I introduced the lily pads in short order. What, what we're putting up there, which is a graphic we only finished last week, is something we would not have been able to put up three months ago. It's moving quite fast, uh, very fast in some areas. We've been astonished. Things we thought might happen are now beginning to happen, but the lily pads are beginning to come together, but not in the, maybe the, the, the scale that is needed. But there are institutions like the B team, which involves leaders, not just Paul Palmer, but, but about 24 CEO levels who are focusing on the climate change yeah. sustainability issues. There are a number of organizations out there of, of, of leaders dealing with these big societal issues. There are things you could be part of which are happening and building very fast, yes. Yeah. And I, I would make one other suggestion. It was Fortune uh, at the last CEO summit, which was at the Vatican, uh, there's a printout, and at the, um, at the suggestion of the Pope, those CEOs came together in working groups around some key issues that are linked to the Sustainable Development Goals, and they came out with very specific ways to address some of the things we're talking about. And that's a public document. If you want to, if you can't find it, I'm happy to get it for you. Um, let's go here and then, yeah. Hi, Bailey Shaw. And my question is inspired by your presentation about these existential threats facing corporations today. And I want to preface my question by saying that I'm asking this in the spirit of thinking the unpalatable. So why do we assume that the survival of corporations is actually good or even necessary? I think that's for this, this, this conference rather than for us. Um, <laughs> But you make an important point about how unpalatables are put on the agenda. Uh, and if we are talking about significant changes, seismic changes in so many areas, of course, corporates are necessary as a body to facilitate economic activity. The question is how easily they will be able to survive in the current set of new realities. I mean, what you're talking about is, a, is really above the kind of things we've been thinking about. It's a, it's a value judgment as to the morality almost of the survival of, of corporations. But we are reporting to you. We're not making our judgment. We are reporting to you what those behind closed doors are privately telling us. And that's why it's important data. And there are very interesting conversations going on about different t terminology, whether it's inclusive capitalism or responsive capitalism or transformative cap capitalism, which address some of those unpalatable questions yes. you've raised. And thank you for that question. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm back again. Bjorn here. Um, in, in your interviews, in, you know, if, you th if you think of this through the lens of the zeitgeist, I mean, what's the spirit of our time and how is that different from, from, from cultures that we've seen uh, only recently? My take on this, and this is not a question, this is just me being me and just telling you what I think, uh, is that we are suffering from a huge decency deficiency. That there's a breakdown of character and integrity uh, everywhere. You know, fake news, uh, people just lying and getting away with it and so on and so forth. And that is something that is not started by someone or a campaign, but it's somehow, there is a, I think, there is almost like a, a biological breakdown of decency which, which we need to to address. I was asked at a, at a workshop with a, a large corporation what the response should be from a company in these, in these times. And I said, well, you should respond to everything with overwhelming decency. Hmm. Because I think that is what's lacking here. Have, did you pick up anything like this in your conversation? Yeah, there, there's, a, there's a slide which I was going to end on, but it's not up there at the moment. Two words, courage and humility. Those are the two leitmotifs coming through as helpful to understanding that perpetuating what is going on at the moment is no longer going to be a guarantee. So I hope that picks up courage and humility. Those at the top might not know everything. So let's get reverse mentoring. Let's get a much greater engagement right through the company, right through the institution as well. And governments, I don't have to tell you what's happening down in Washington, but, and it's the same in the civil service in Britain. Too many civil servants are feeling deeply, deeply uncomfortable because they're being asked to do things which they do not actively, personally feel comfortable doing. And Bjorn, I can cheer you up afterwards by showing you the website Beneficial AI. Some of the finest minds and doers in the field of AI looking at the big social and societal issues, yeah. the huge challenges that Nick referred to. In a sense, we can shape our future. It doesn't have to be inevitable. 
and, I, uh, and, th and th they were meeting in Puerto Rico in January, same time as Davos. Davos gets all the coverage, but that conference is groundbreaking. It's all on the, on the web. I can show you to you later. So we have about five minutes left, and I want to give you uh, a couple minutes for your uh, closing remarks. Um, both Nick and Chris are staying the entire conference, and so they'll, if you want to have sidebar conversations, you know, you're welcome to do that. We'll take a question we'd, we'd over love here. It. And or another we'll, session, and then if we'll you take, want. Or another session. We'll do an session. impromptu session. <laughs> we can do sessions over lunch, and then we'll take that. will be the last one. So let's... Yeah, uh, sorry. Frank Oviet, uh, you keep saying you're not running a campaign. You're presenting data to us. So what I'm going to do is test to see whether there's some other data behind it. And I'm <laughs> thinking of your chart of the problems you say could have been put up 30 years ago and the issues that are being faced today that we've known this is coming for two years or three years and, and do, didn't do anything about it. And it does seem to me that whether you see the solution to the world's problems as being down a left path, a right path, or through the center, that arguably we're going to spend several days here talking about an awful lot of first world problems. So we can't be doing everything wrong. But I guess my question for your data is, is there anything in there that tells us how it is that we've missed these things coming for several years and find ourselves having to deal with them? on an emergency basis now. Yeah, Mel, can we just put up um, uh, the, the uh, output, please, of the laptop? Mel, if you're back there. This, these are the answer to your question. It may, you may say, so what? We've known all that for a long time. The fact is, this is what those inside are telling us. And you may find it uncomfortable. You may say there's nothing new. But to answer your question, this is what's happening inside and why a lot of stuff is simply not getting to the top. Not getting to the top and therefore is not actively being considered um, by the board, by the chairman and chief executive. And they've told us the risk register is too narrow. We need to broaden it. But of course, risk, chief risk officers are saying we're under political instructions or instructions from the top to do things only in a very narrow stovepipe way. So these are the tensions, and you're right to identify that, but it, let me reassure you, this is not a campaign. This is just saying this is what's happening at the moment. I'm very happy to share data outside the room with you in a bit more detail and to hear your challenges. Yeah. Last question. Uh, Brad Staples with uh, APCON. Um, I'm not sure this is so unpalatable. I think the underlying trend is actually one that we can be quite optimistic about, which is a democratization and a disaggregation of power around the world. And that is a source for optimism. It may mean that the world's traditional media feels that it's not at the center stage in determining how the news is reported. And it may be that the likes of Putin and Xi Jinping and certainly Narendra Modi are a very authentic representation of the true will and interest of the people in their own countries. They certainly have massive popular support, even if we don't like them so much. Yeah, I don't think this is about media, Brad, at all. I think um, this is about the pressures that there are uh, at the top. And we were talking about this briefly in London last week. But I would suggest to you, I wouldn't be doing this had there not been what happened in 2014, which has now proliferated and cascaded. It wasn't just a passing phase of a new normal, which no one could define. It's something which has become quite significant, which has led, and I'm now bringing us back to where we started, uh, to the issues of populism, nationalism, and globalization. And my, my very strong point remains to you. Otherwise, we wouldn't be up here risking our own personal reputations, saying things which are uncomfortable, is that this is also a reflection of the inability of leadership to understand the enormity of what is taking place and the alienation, the granula granularization of politics, the episodic nature of the new people who are out there who want to do things in a different way, and traditional structures, as probably is going to be discovered in the German and French elections, is not adequate anymore. And this is happening very, very quickly. If we're wrong in a year's time, I'll buy you lunch. And I, I'm not saying that in a facetious way. I'd love to feel as optimistic as you sound. I don't think that can be a working assumption, if I may say. But I, I would just, because I come from the peace-building world where you have to remain optimism, given all the things that go wrong, <laughs> there are things with new communication technologies to, f to advance the good. I, of that, I'm sure. That's why we're, well, I'm motivated to be involved in this project. So um, before we wrap up, I think the reason that I thought this was an important conversation to have at the beginning 
is that I hope all of us, as in, to Brad's point, when we go through and we try to hear these activists talk to us about why they're doing what they're doing and how it fits into this complexity, that we all try to maybe see the other side of this and think in ways that are different than we think about every day from where we sit. And that's the, the real the point, because I think going back to um, you know, uh, what, was, what Frank, I guess, was talking about before is that um, what, what their works, when you go in and you read them, the overwhelming sentiment is that all of us, and especially the people we report to or work for, um, live a life where certain things have happened over time that just make us less sharp about seeing these trends coming down because we're kind of a product of more group thinking. And I think that to do our jobs well, we're on the front lines all the time. What is it that could enhance our ability to do our jobs better by being able to see ahead and being able to uh, predict what's out there? So I don't know if you have a final word, but we're just Can I just leave you with, with one, 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 a couple of quotes which came from the British ambassador to the European Union, when out of the blue he decided to resign on the 3rd of January this year. Um, he'd been having a run-in with Theresa May on Brexit, and the language he used in his 1,300-word resignation email to his staff was really a summary of the kind of things which we'd already uncovered, which led to Brexit, uh, but which were seen as incredibly uncomfortable for a lot of people, but now are being embraced at least um, more readily, even if not with comfort. The need for people inside, the mindset, culture, and behavior issue, the need for people inside to challenge ill-founded arguments and muddled thinking, and above all, that you will never be afraid to speak the truth to those in power. I hope you'll support each other in those difficult moments where you have to deliver messages that are disagreeable to those who need to hear them. And what we're seeing is, around the world, including in Africa at the moment, other leaders, corporate, and also political leaders who are watching what's happening in your country and our country and are saying, what can we get away with in future? Because others are getting away with it now. So that is part of the seismic change. But as I said to Brad, I hope that in a year's time we can say uh, this was a passing So Nick's going to buy us all lunch yes. in a year's time because we're going to solve all the problems in the next few days. Thank you very much. Thank you for Thank having you. us. Thank you.